Revelation 20 tells us of a time of a thousand years. When will it start? And what will happen during that time? Who will live during this time? And where will they spend this time? The Bible gives us all the answers. Francois will help us to get a better understanding of this important subject. Before we do a detailed study of the millennium, let me quickly tell you what it's all about. We are living in the last days. Soon there will be a resurrection called the first resurrection. Then after a thousand years transpire, there will be a second resurrection. At the beginning of the thousand years, Jesus will come. The righteous dead will be raised and taken to heaven. Satan will be bound. The wicked will be slain. And the earth will be desolate. During the thousand years, the righteous will be in heaven, while the wicked will remain dead. Satan and his angels will be bound to this desolate planet. The new Jerusalem, with Christ and his saints, descend from heaven at the end of the thousand years. The wicked are raised, and this event loosens the devil from the circumstances that bound him. The last judgment takes place, and sinners and Satan are destroyed. And then the climax. This earth will be cleansed and restored once more to its original beauty. Let's begin our study by listening to John the Revelator describing the glorious climactic nature of the second coming of Christ. Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 to 16 I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one but he himself knows. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. While the wicked are in the process of destroying God's children, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords comes to their rescue in all the splendor of heaven. What a day of rejoicing that would be for those who prepared for this day. What will happen to the wicked? Unfortunately, they will be lost forever. Listen to what the prophets have to say about their very, very sad fate. Second Thessalonians 1 verses 7 and 8 The Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Verse 8 says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Isaiah 11 verse 4, He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Revelation chapter 6 verses 16 and 17 They call to the mountains and the rocks Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Chapter 7 says Only those who have the seal of the living God Those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb Will survive the glory of Christ's second coming Let's go back to Revelation 19 and read from verses 17 to 21. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in mid-air, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you can eat the flesh of kings, generals and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf, 
With these signs he deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulphur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. What a horrible end for those who have despised God's grace. The prophet Jeremiah also saw the fate of the wicked in a vision and he writes in Jeremiah 25 verse 33. At that time those slain by the Lord will be everywhere from one end of the earth to the other. They will not be mourned or gathered up or buried but will be like refuse lying on the ground. Why will they not be mourned or buried? Well, the wicked are dead and all the righteous will go to heaven when Jesus comes. The devil and his angels won't bother to bury them. Revelation 20 verses 1 and 2 And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key of the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. What a marvelous prophecy! The devil will be bound for a thousand years. What kind of chain do you think this would be? It's a chain of circumstances. All the wicked are dead and all the righteous are in heaven. There is no one to tempt. For a thousand years, Satan will have time to look at the results of his rebellion. I suppose he and his angels will have quite a few quarrels at this stage, blaming and accusing one another. For how long will he and his angels be in bondage? Verse 3 says, He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Now let's inquire about the meaning of abyss or bottomless pit. The words bottomless pit are translated from the Greek word abusos, from which we also have our English word abyss. The Standard Dictionary defines abyss as primal chaos. Thus, in the beginning, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, or abyss. Genesis 1 verse 2. Can you imagine the devil's agony, spending a thousand years on this dark, dismal, broken up planet? He used to live in God's presence, beholding the glories of the eternal. And now he sits in darkness. Listen to Jeremiah's description of this time. Chapter 4 verses 23 and 24 I looked at the earth and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains and they were quaking, and all the hills were swaying. 25-26 I looked... And there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. How many people will be left on this planet during the thousand years? None. The prophet says none. Listen to the following description. Isaiah 24 verse 1 and 3 See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. All the prophets in the Bible agree that the wicked will be destroyed at the beginning of the thousand years when Jesus comes. But what about the righteous who are alive and those who are in the grave? John 5, 28, 29 Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. According to this verse, who will rise first? It says the righteous. Who will rise afterwards? The text says it's the unrighteous. Paul also spoke of a first resurrection of the righteous, implying a second resurrection for the wicked. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. John calls those who rise in the first resurrection blessed. 
But can he tell us when this resurrection will take place? Revelation chapter 20 verse 6 Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. This is very clear. As we saw at the beginning of the lecture, the thousand years begins with the second coming. At that very moment, the righteous dead are raised from their graves. No one who has a saving relationship with Jesus can remain in the grave when he comes a second time. And of course, when all this takes place, Satan gets bound because there is no one to tempt. But what about those who are alive when Jesus comes? What will happen to them? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 to 53 Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. What a glorious prospect! When Jesus comes, we mortals will receive the gift of immortality. And we perishable people will be clothed with God's imperishable gift. There will only be two classes when Jesus comes, the saved and the unsaved. One class will go to heaven and the other class will perish through their own choice. While the devil remains on this desolate planet for a thousand years, the saints will reign in heaven. Let's carefully listen to John's explanation. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life. The Greek and various other translations say that they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. John identifies two groups who will do the judging. First, the beheaded martyrs stand for all those who were persecuted for Christ's sake. John sees them in their sealed and resurrected state in heaven. The other class are those who were alive at the second coming of Christ. They refused to worship the beast and his image, and they did not receive his mark. Revelation 20 verse 4 says that these two classes, those who were resurrected and those who were translated at the second coming, will be given authority to judge. What does this mean? This judgment does not determine who among the dead is lost and who is to be saved. God himself has already made that decision. During the millennium, the unrighteous dead will be irretrievably lost. The judgment in which the redeemed will be involved will be to audit the books. They are going to re-examine the evidences on which God has made his decisions. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 2 and 3 Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? What a fair God! We will be allowed to judge for ourselves why certain people are not in heaven. All our questions will be answered during this time of investigation. If by God's grace I'll be there, I would love to look into the mysteries of the history of Lucifer who caused so much misery. I want to read how God pled with him when he became proud because of his beauty. By allowing us to judge the wicked, God promises to answer all our questions. I can promise you that at the end of the thousand years, we will not have a single question concerning God's fairness in dealing with mortals. Before studying the events that will transpire at the end of the millennium, let's review the events occurring during this time. All the righteous are in heaven, occupying themselves with a judgment. The wicked remain in their graves. Satan and his angels are alive and bound on this earth. And of course the earth remains desolate during this period. 
Revelation chapter 20 verse 9 and also 21 verses 2 and 10 tell us that the holy city, the new Jerusalem, will descend from heaven at the end of the thousand years. What will happen to the wicked dead at this time? Revelation chapter 20 verse 5 The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years ended. Can you imagine that vast unnumbered host? All those who had rejected God's call to repentance are raised from their graves. And if I neglect to repent, I will be among this unhappy crowd. Revelation chapter 20 verse 7 And when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. The resurrection of the wicked will give the devil and his angels a last opportunity to do their work of deception. And now for one of the most dramatic revelations of God's fairness in all the Bible. Before he finally destroys the unfortunate wicked, he gives them a glimpse of his righteous character. Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 and 12 Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Who are these people? The lost? Where do they come from? Revelation 20.13 It says, The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. At the beginning of the thousand years, all the wicked were slain by the brightness of his coming. The wicked that were already in their graves were not raised at the second coming, and they remained dead. Revelation chapter 20 verse 13 says that many of them were resurrected from the sea because so many people drowned in the ocean. And now, at the end of the thousand years, all the wicked are raised to receive the wages of sin. And what are these wages of sin? It's eternal death. This is the last great judgment. In our previous studies, we looked at the investigative judgment, which began in 1844 and ended at the second coming of Christ. We discovered that Jesus brought his reward to his saints at this time. And what was their reward? Eternal life. At the end of the thousand years, he pays the wages of willful rejection of his grace. And what is that? Let's read Revelation chapter 20 verse 13 again. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. What a solemn and awesome moment. This passage tells us about the day when the wicked will have to give an account of their deeds in the presence of God. Someone asked Daniel Webster, What is the greatest thought that ever passed through your mind? He replied, My accountability to God. At the end of the thousand years, every single person who ever lived will meet around the great white throne on which Jesus is seated. And for the first time, the entire human race looks at him simultaneously. The saved will be inside the city and the lost will be outside. Just before the wicked attack the city and just before God destroys them with fire, he reveals to them a panoramic view of his wonderful plan of salvation. It begins with Lucifer, the angel of light who began his rebellion in heaven. And then we will look at the scene of his humiliating defeat and expulsion from heaven. We will then be taken to the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and caused the fall of humanity. I think there will be special emphasis on Jesus first coming to our dark, cold and unfriendly world. The cruel scenes in Pilate's judgment hall will be repeated. Eventually we will see Jesus taking the sins of the world upon himself. In this panoramic view we will see a demonstration of the Father's love when Jesus eventually died on the cruel cross. 
What effect will this mighty panoramic view have on the human race? Listen to what Paul tells us about this solemn moment. Romans 14 verses 10 to 12 You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Can you see that vast sea of people falling down on their knees when they look at the scene of Calvary, acknowledging that God was right and good and they were wrong? Philippians chapter 2 verses 10 and 11 At the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God and the Father. Not only will the people on earth bow and confess that Christ is Lord and Saviour, but the entire heavenly host and the unfallen worlds will do the same. Revelation 15 verse 3 and 4 Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, and your righteous acts have been revealed. Will this special revelation of God's unselfish love have a saving effect on the devil and the wicked people? No. Verse 9 says, They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. The display of Christ on the great white throne and the panorama of the plan of salvation had only a momentary effect on the wicked. Their hearts have not changed and under Satan's leadership they march up to the city and surround it. What's going to happen next? Revelation 20 verse 9 But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. What a very, very sad end. Nothing will be left of them. David had this interesting vision about the fate of the lost. Psalms 37 verse 20 But the wicked will perish. The Lord's enemies will be like the beauty of the fields. They will vanish like smoke. Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 3 Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. But what about the devil? Will he also be burned to ashes, annihilated completely, or will he burn forever and ever and ever? Ezekiel 28 verses 18 and 19 By your many sins and dishonest trade you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you, and I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Revelation 20 verse 14 says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. When will hell happen? When I die or at the end of the thousand years? The Bible says at the end of the thousand years. The realization that I'm lost because of my own choosing will be worse than the physical pain of the fire that will consume me. I personally believe that at the end of the millennium God simply lets sin play out the full length of its course. God simply withdraws his control over the physical laws of our world. He could tell the neutrons and the protons and the positrons and the mu mesons and the anti-lambda particles and the 30 or more additional subatomic particles that make up the matter of our planet to go their own way and do their own thing. Since the time of Eden, the devil attacked the law of God, telling people it's a burden and should be done away with. 
Up till the end of the thousand years, God has refused Satan's demand that his laws be done away with. Why? He knew what would happen. Total destruction. But now, in fairness to his enemy, he removes the restraints and lets Satan and sinners have the way they ask for. And the watching universe, which has already seen the degradation of character that results from breaking God's moral laws, now sees in one frightening display of awesome destruction why God's physical laws are so necessary. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Verse 10, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. John sees the planet go up in flames and burn out completely, but as this terrible scene fades from his vision, he sees something fantastic. Revelation 21 verse 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Verse 2, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What will we be like? Have you ever given this a thought? Well, without sin and sinners and the devil around, it's going to be too marvelous for words. But let's listen to some more exciting news from the Bible. 1 John 3 verse 2 Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known but we know that when he appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. What a thought! We will be like him in character. One of these days we are going to see our Saviour and Creator at work. He's going to cover the earth made new with beautiful flowers and we will watch him doing it. What a prospect. Revelation 21 verse 1 says the sea, symbol of separation, will no longer exist. I think instead God will create beautiful pools of water and lovely lakes. We are going to see something that even Adam and Eve did not see. A God of love creating a new world. I don't want to miss out on this great experience. What about you? At times I get homesick for heaven. Just to think it's going to be a place without clouds of worry and frustration and battle. The great controversies ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in the unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. How can you and I be there? Do you think it's possible for sinners like us to make it to heaven? The Bible says yes, it's possible by God's grace. Galatians chapter 3.29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. If we give our lives to God unconditionally and childlike, we become heirs of eternal peace and happiness. I don't think we should miss out on this. What do you say? Revelation 22 verse 17 The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. 
Thank you, Francois. Friends, what a wonderful time to look forward to. I'm looking forward to meeting you there. Jesus will be waiting for us. Please make sure of your appointment with him. Let us pray. Lord, it is our desire to be ready when Jesus comes. Help us to build a solid relationship with you, and may there be many souls because of the decision they make today. Amen.